Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us online. My name is uh, Manuel Pera from Barcelona, Spain, and together with uh, Mark van bergen Gowen from Amsterdam, the Netherlands, we are your chairs for today's webinar on registries and audits in esophagogastric cancer surgery. Thank you for participating in this interesting session. The ISD mission is to promote the exchange of scientific and medical knowledge of the esophagus in the field. And today's webinar is a clear example of it. I will let uh, Mark Van bergen to uh, uh, explain the uh, schedule of our session today, and then uh, we will present our first speaker. Mark. Thank you, uh, Manuel. It's great to, to be here, and it's great that we have the opportunity of the ISD to, uh, to, uh, to get everybody together for this very interesting uh, webinar. Um, it's really an honor to have this outstanding group of panelists here who will share their uh, experience on this uh, topic. And um, I think it's a good idea to have all the panelists turn on their cameras right now so I can introduce uh, everybody that is here. Um, we have um, a number of speakers, apart from, uh, from, from us as, uh, as the chairpersons. We have uh, Natalie Coburn. Uh, she's a surgical oncologist from Sunnybrook's Cancer Center in Canada. Uh, with us is also Bill Ellum, uh, upper GI surgeon from the Royal Marsden in the UK. Jan Johansen, he's uh, head of Israel and Gastric Surgery of Lund University Hospital in Sweden. Uh, Shiraz Markar, uh, he is a senior Israel Gastric Fellow from Oxford in the UK. He is not yet here, but will be landing soon, and then he will uh, join us all. Uh, Pernilla Lagergren is here, Professor of Surgical Care Sciences at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Um, Nick Maynard is with us. He's a consultant upper GI surgeon from Oxford University Hospital and uh, from the UK. And of course, we have uh, Masayuki Watanabe, who's the deputy hospital director of the Cancer Institute Hospital in Japan. So it's really great to have you all here. And I think it's uh, good to uh, start right away. Um, I want to tell the audience that there's the possibility of uh, asking questions to the uh, outstanding panel. We'll try to answer them. And if not, uh, we'll answer them afterwards and you, can, you will be able to read them back through the ISD Facebook uh, page, which will be uh, sent uh, uh, on the email later. But um, let me uh, start um, right away because uh, I think it's time for our uh, first speaker. And that will be um, Bill Allen. Um, and he will have his talk on defining quality of care in esophagogastric cancer surgery. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to ISD for putting together this webinar, which I think is extremely timely quality of care for patients with gastrogastric cancer has gained a lot of momentum in recent years, largely because we have got more successful in treating the disease and are now looking at the best ways of doing so, and particularly with longer term outcome issues. In a way, quality of care reflects how we would wish to be treated if we or members of our family were unfortunately diagnosed with esophagogastric cancer. The issue of determining what quality actually means is challenging. Um, there are a number of different definitions, but I've chosen this one because it, I think, highlights three specific items which actually work well and dovetail into the discussions that we're going to have um, with the other presentations about audit. Let's start with safety. We know esophageal gastric cancer surgery is uh, an extremely uh, challenging uh, treatment. Uh, it requires careful patient selection, careful attention to detail with the surgery, and of course this is done within the context of current approaches with neoadjuvant therapies. And this study from Richard van Hilgensberg group, I'm sure many of you will know, 
which clearly demonstrates the issues with regard to complications and the adverse effect that this has on uh, mortality, hospital stay, reoperation and readmission. The key two are the pulmonary complications. Obviously, with an intrathoracic procedure, there is a significant risk to respiratory function. And of course, there's the issue around anastomotic leakage, which is still a challenge for all surgeons. So safety-wise, it's a challenging activity. What is important, however, is that we all speak the same language. And this work by Don Lowe and his colleagues, I think has been fundamental in clearly demonstrating the standardization of definition of what complications are so that we can compare like with like and institution with institution, which is what Don has done with this benchmarking paper that followed on from the initial ESO data uh, publication. And it allows international calibration. You saw from the author list on the, on the publication, it is worldwide. And what is striking, I think, is a reflection of how we have got come forward so far in the last 20 years with such low uh, mortality rates. But despite that, it is a, a, a morbid producing procedure with at nearly 60% overall complications. The other thing I think we have to be conscious of with regard to safety is the introduction of new techniques. Uh, latterly, there has been this significant increase in minimally invasive procedures. Uh, and this study again from Holland shows that comparing 2007 and 2014, that approximately 50% of procedures worldwide are done minimally invasively. Now, we've got to make sure that what we're doing is appropriate. There's no point having an instrument, a robot, a new set of minimally invasive tools, thinking you can do the same thing as we've learned to do open in open surgery. And I think it's therefore highly, highly relevant that we should reflect on this so that all of the information that we glean as we take forward these approaches is very carefully assessed, very carefully audited, hence the discussions later. And I think it's crucial that there's patient involvement to be aware of what is being, what is being offered to them, as of course, this is a relatively new procedure and we're still learning our way through it. Uh, and as you will know, there are still challenging, particularly with the uh, anastomotic techniques. And I think this sort of initiative from ISDE to try and set up a structured training program, uh, which is continuing to evolve. And there will be discussion about this at the forthcoming meeting uh, of the ES, the European branch of ISDE uh, and the uh, European Gastric Cancer uh, Chapter to look at the way in which training can be done uh, and to meet the same sort of targets. But it is essential that the outcomes for these procedures must be open and transparent. So patient safety is paramount. Moving on, effectiveness in a way you could say is a reflection of safety, um, but I think it's a bit more than just that because we have had guidelines for many years which have reviewed the available information and data that's published from trials. These are updated regularly and believe me, it does take an awful lot of effort to get these updated and, and submitted for appropriate publication. And this is just a, a selection of the, th of the uh, principal ones that are available currently, all having their own uh, recommendation, but as a rule, most of them are consistent. But do we need more guidelines? As I say, it does take a long time to produce them. Um, and as a consequence, it can be challenging to get these into practice. Should we actually be setting standards based upon these guidelines? The ECHO organization has over the last few years looked at essential requirements for quality care and have, I, have identified criteria which all providers, whatever cancer you're dealing with, um, can meet and also to set performance indicators that recognize again that to a certain extent it doesn't matter where the patient undergoes their treatment, uh, that the quality performance is maintained by adherence to appropriate guidance. And this was something that we did a few years ago, looking at esophageal cancer. And the key to this, and I think it's the key to most activities uh, to prove effectiveness, is the working of the multidisciplinary team or tumour board. In the way in which they can interrelate, share the practices, share the appropriate treatments uh, to select the best treatment for the individual patient. Certainly, I think individualised treatment is, is the way we go from here onwards. 
But of course, we're not going to know how we've got on with these standards unless we audit. And my colleagues will talk specifically about the individual audits that they have been undertaking. There are also other opportunities, including reviews of uh, uh, countries' activities. And we did this uh, a few years ago, looking at pathways of patients uh, across a number of European countries, looking at a number of uh, criteria, including the organization of the way the, the patient moves along the pathway, the type of practice recommended by individual institutions, the sort of workforce that supported patients, uh, together with the crucial component of education and training, uh, as well as uh, what is often not necessarily fully recognized by many, the importance of clinical research. And what we found was in fact, to a certain extent you'd expect this, that diagnosis and uh, pathology reporting were very consistent. And interestingly at this time, there had been quite a lot of movement in the European countries to centralization of surgery on centers undertaking the larger volume activity. But what is interesting, I think, is the slightly softer areas where there was significant variation. Nurse specialists and dietitians are crucial, but they need to be resourced, they need to be adequately trained, and they need to have patient, easy patient access. There's variation on the frequency of multidisciplinary team meeting, uh, and I think that's a key standard that, that underpins all that we do. And there's variability in the, res in, in the resourcing for research and audit. And that's why the national audits that you're gonna hear about are so crucial uh, for determining how effective our treatments are. And then the third topic is patient experience. What is it like to be a patient to go through this sort of treatment and have we, have we done everything we possibly can to make it as good as we should? Nick Maynard will talk about the UK experience in this, with the National Esophago Gastric Cancer Audit. But as a, as a side issue on this, um, there is now a very strong patient group involved with the uh, re clinical reference group for the audit, which has very clearly articulated that patients want as much information as they possibly can. And therefore, they need to know the details of what's going to happen to them. And this guide that's been a supplement has proved very helpful. But I think one of the keys here is making sure that we as professionals know what the patient wants. We're very keen to make sure the patient survives the operation having selected them to go through it. We like to make sure we minimize our risks of anastomotic leakage. We want to make sure that the patient can leave hospital eating and drinking without necessarily any support in as timely a fashion as possible. But what is interesting the patients actually have some other issues, which is totally understandable, I think. And we need to be aware of this in the planning of treatments. They want to make sure that they are getting uh, their weight back, that they're able to eat and drink, and they're able to go out with their family to restaurants and they're returning their activity to normal. So in conclusion, I think quality assurance, the understanding of it and how you put it into practice is absolutely everyone's responsibility. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, uh, thanks Bill for an excellent talk. And I heard the dog also agreed with you uh, during that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no problem.